The Witch, a New England's folktale from 2015, is not a regular horror film. The director and writer Robert Eggers has said it's supposed to be the worst nightmare of a Puritan. The movie is set in the 1630s New England and is about a family that is banished to live outside of society by the woods. At first, the perhaps a bit too optimistic father vainly claims he will conquer the wilderness, but things quickly start to almost literally head south. A baby disappears, the crops die, and the twin children of the family start accusing the oldest sister of being a witch. But as the title suggests, I'm later gonna argue that the movie isn't really about witches. This video has two parts. The first one is a summary and review and is intended for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. The second part, however, is an analysis for anyone who has seen it or just doesn't mind spoilers. The analysis part starts around three minutes. Check the comments and description for timestamps. Okay, so first of all, I don't typically like horror movies. Or what I mean really is, I don't like cheap jump scares and literal horror. What makes this movie so spooky isn't its hair-raising, eerie atmosphere or the monster in the woods. It's the monster inside each and every one of us. It's the terror of being accused by the ones you trust of something you didn't do, which often leads to becoming the monster people think you are. The thing I will spoil is the fact that there is only one jump scare in this entire movie, which I think helps it scare you much, much deeper. Jump scares are kind of relieving in that sense, that you get a break from the mental captivity that horror puts you in. It's like a slap in the face that snaps you out of it and lets you breathe. This movie is merciless in that sense, that it holds your balls and squeezes them for an hour and a half. What also makes this movie a masterpiece is the perfect balance between psychological and physical horror. I told you it's arguably about the monster inside, but don't let that ease you. The movie has plenty of horrifying scenes with visual grotesqueness and chilling implications. The soundtrack is also eerily beautiful and synergizes well with the impressively executed 17th century setting. But no matter how much I love this movie, I have to be honest, it's not for everyone. At times it's a bit slow and dark and requires you to pay attention. The language is also a bit difficult to understand without subtitles because they speak in an old-fashioned way. It also requires you to think a little bit outside of yourself to truly relate to the story because it's from the perspective of and features problems of the people of the time. Nobody today in Western society and many other parts of the world has to ever worry about the crops not being sufficient for winter anymore and being a witch is even cool nowadays. That being said, one of the really scary and relevant things that makes it spooky is that in some parts of the world today, witches are still being accused and punished, even more than of the time this movie is set in. The witch is great for anyone who seeks deeper terror than a spooky ghost or psychopathic killer, who can appreciate aesthetics and composition regardless of the plot. Now here's where the real ride starts and I will truly dig deep into what makes this movie a magnum opus. Don't watch this part if you haven't seen the movie but plan on watching it. Spoiler alert. So what do I mean that it's not really about witches? Well, in my opinion, the witch is a metaphor for each of the characters' excuses for their fears and sins they lead to. The prideful dad's optimism and ignorance, the wrathful mother's hate for her own daughter, the lustful son is lured by a beautiful witch, the slothful and gluttonous twins play all day with Black Philip, and the envious and greedy daughter writes her name in the Book of the Beast. I like to systematize, organize and analyze things, and sometimes fall too deep down the rabbit hole, and it's very possible that this is an incorrect analysis of the characters, but considering the obvious inclusion of religion as a topic in the movie, I've decided to entertain this idea of the seven deadly sins. Bear in mind though that even if you don't agree with my grouping in sin assigning, this still proves the beautiful depth of the characters and that not a single frame was indeliberate. So before you roll your eyes, allow me to explain. The father is very prideful, claiming he will conquer the wilderness and lying to his wife about the silver cup, which results in the eldest daughter being blamed instead. And for that reason, he is punished by failing as a man. He can't grow crops, he can't hunt, and he can't protect his family. The only manly thing left he can do right is chop wood. The mother is also very hysterical and aggressive and often seems much more like the authority in the house rather than the father. This is all the fault of the witches, but the father protects his pride by being ignorant and optimistic and takes out his secret fragile masculinity by chopping wood. 
He vents his problems into what symbolically builds up into a way too big pile, falling over him and giving him the final blow towards his death after he is attacked by Black Philip. The mother's wrath is most evident when she attacks her own daughter and tries to strangle her, but even before that, her hate towards her own blood was obvious in the dialogue. She is failing as a mother, losing her children and acting more masculine than her failing husband. I don't think it's by chance that she tries to strangle her only left living child after having breastfed a raven, a scene that still churns my guts. It's ironic that the child she hates so much was the only one that she had left after the others were taken by the devil, making her wrath climax to the point of kin slaughter. Her failure as a mother is just like in the father's case, thanks to the witches who has been taking her children, and it's perhaps the punishment for her resentment for her own daughter. It then fits very perfectly that her mother dies by the hands of her innocent daughter, who as a result became the monster she wrongfully was accused of being, right after she signs the book of the beast and becomes a witch. The eldest son lusts for his older sister. He is often gazing at her chest, though it's implied by his expressions that he knows it's wrong to do so. Yet his lust is what ends up luring him into a witch's nest when he sees a beautiful young woman with a perky bust. He returns to the farm later. It's during a rainy night and he is naked like a heretic, perhaps as a symbol of him succumbing to his animalistic lust outside of marriage and with a witch at that. But like I've said, it's not really about witches. He knows it's wrong to want his sister, yet he's proven weak to temptation. He dies during an exorcism, proclaiming his love for Jesus and the divine, but the way he speaks of Christ seems awfully sensual, which is why the mother later suspects that it was indeed the devil speaking. A very interesting detail about the son is his lie about him and his father going to the woods to look for apples. This is beautifully revisited during his exorcism, where an apple comes out of his lying mouth. There's not really that much to say about the twins, other than the fact that they are slothfully never working and gluttonously always playing and arguably overweight. Early on they annoy their older sister, causing her to pretend like she's a witch to scare them. Something interesting though is that the female twin claims to have spoken to the goat Black Philip and seen a witch at night. She's also playing, pretending to be a witch herself. It could be that initially she was the one the witches were trying to claim and not the oldest daughter, but anyways, their gluttonous playing with Black Philip is what, in the end, gets them killed, locked up with the same goat and their older sister. When the oldest sister tells the father that they have been talking to Black Philip, and he has obviously seen them playing with the ram and singing songs about him, the father locks the twins and the oldest daughter together with the goats for the night. When they wake up, the playful jest of the oldest daughter pretending to be a witch has become reality, because if the mother is to be believed, she has the twins' bloods on her hands. This yet reinforces my earlier point about her becoming the monster people wrongfully accuse her of being. That being said, the goats and the twins were in fact killed by a witch who visited and drank blood from one of the regular goats' udders. Thomasin, the protagonist and eldest daughter herself, is a very complicated and amazing character, which is why I assigned her with both envy and greediness. This movie is basically her coming of age story, and in my opinion, about her degeneration as a woman. When she finds out she is going to be wed away to another family, her and the younger brother who lusts for her go into the woods to try to hunt and prove to their parents that they can survive. This is the first sign of the daughter's greed, envy and degeneration, because she wants to come with her brother into the woods. She doesn't want to embrace womanhood and what is expected of a girl in her time. Her being the one who lost the baby to the witches while playing peekaboo might also be a sign of her rejection of the expectation of women in the 17th century society, but that's perhaps stretching it a bit too far. I also don't think it's by chance that the family has a failing father and a dominant mother, and then she ends up becoming a witch, which symbolically can be interpreted as her freeing herself and becoming a slut by devoting herself to the devil. I'm using the word slut because it's the word her mother uses. In today's society, I don't think this sin is very relevant, being greedy for freedom or envious of masculinity. But from the viewpoint of the era the movie is set in, the witch here is her greed for a materialistic life where she needs no man to own her other than the devil. The devil even uses butter and a pretty dress as temptation for her to become a witch. Her taking her clothes off and venturing into the woods is basically her taking off the bondage that women were in. I'm not trying to argue that the portrayed devil worship in the film is right or even defendable, I'm just saying that it's beautiful how things we take for granted today would maybe lead to witch accusations a few centuries ago. So that's my analysis of the characters based in the Seven Deadly Sins and how it didn't really have anything to do with the witches. But another way to interpret this movie is of course the good old classic everyone's just crazy and was hallucinating it all. But for this movie in particular, it might actually be valid. 
Early on in the film, the family's corn harvest has been plagued by a blight. The ergot fungus was very prevalent in these times and has later been speculated to make people who consumed it experience symptoms such as hallucinations. So whether you want a monster horror film about witches, a psychological thriller about paranoid puritans on the verge of starvation, or a mixture of the two about a hallucinating isolated family, this movie is phenomenal and I absolutely love it. Subscribe for more like this in the future and have a wonderful day. Peace.